Hello and welcome to the Greatest Movie Ever podcast, where we dissect our guest's favourite film in all its silver screen cinematic scope. This week I'm joined by Adam Fellman. He's a great battle rapper and rapper that goes under the pseudonym Most Prob. He famously proposed during a rap battle which went viral. He's written numerous blogs across a range of subjects. And in general, he's just an all-round good guy. He's here to discuss The Room. How's it going, Adam? Hello, Paul. Very, very nice to be here. And thank you for saying nice things about about me. Um, that, that was nice. Um, yeah, I'm I'm excited. I like I like talking about the room a lot. Um, and it was actually going to be the subject of my dissertation, the film. But then um, the guy literally sitting next to me said it before me. And also, there's barely anything out there academic on it because, well, for obvious reasons, really. Yeah. But uh, yeah. Yeah, hello. Well, I must admit, I hate this film. Um, like it's good, it's good in an ironic way, but I would never put it on to enjoy myself. Like a lot of exposure that I've had to it through memes and YouTube compilations. So I'll start by asking, why do you enjoy it so much? Okay, so yeah, I mean, I said a little uh, like before the call, and uh, you know, I am under no illusions. That this is a terrible, terrible movie. Like, if you, it's taken at face value, it has almost no merit as a film. So, I'm not, you know, I'm not gonna sit here and pretend ironically like it's, you know, an absolute masterpiece because it's clearly not. Um, but the reason I love this movie, and I've been familiar with this movie now for about a decade. Um, and the amount of, it's one of those movies that is a shared experience with friends. It's, it, it really is. If you're watching it on your own for the first time, or if your exposure to it is just sitting at home, scrolling through Facebook and seeing like, a, oh, top 10 things that are wrong with the room, um, kind of, you know, Buzzfeed montage. It's just, it, you're not going to get the full experience of it and I think because of that like communal aspect of it and because of the actual story behind how it came to be and who Tommy Wiseau is and what people don't know about him um, it's uh, it just has this mystique about it that no other film has yeah like, and, sorry there's, there's like a huge following yeah, really um, when I was researching it I, I found like there's still midnight screenings going on for it around the globe constantly like it ran for so many years in LA and it's it has got this massive phenomenon behind it where people just they'll get a cinema they'll invite 400 people or whatever and just have a showing of the room and everyone will be shouting out um like joining in with the the movie all the the famous quotes in it it is crazy how it has kind of got this community to it because even the best films of all time they kind of struggle to get that sort of notoriety where people will happily go along to screenings just for the live experience of it have you ever been to a screening of it or yes i have been to i think three screenings at this point really um, wow yeah yeah, I've been to I've been to two in London and one when it came down to Brighton, um, and I went to see a screening of The Disaster Artist as well, with not the movie but the documentary. Okay. That Greg Sestero, who who's one of the co-stars in the movie, and um, yeah, he didn't. He was there, kind of giving a talk about it, and um, yeah, like there, there is. It, it's such he often turns up to these talks as well so like maybe three talks in every ten he'll be at just answering questions in complete non sequiturs and just just being Tommy Wiseau about it and I think that I don't I couldn't name you any other movie that has had the kind of low key cultural impact that the room has and is such an immediate connector between people like if you're either you watch the room together and it's something you then quote back at each other forever um, my marriage has at least one line from the room in it each day and that's not that's not an exaggeration like yeah. that 100% you know and if you meet someone else who's already seen the room however you're instantly friends 
Yeah. You, 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 you instantly get along. It's like, it's like battle rap. There's a lot like battle rap. Like, you know, if you mention, um, if you mention Pedro to someone who's familiar with who Pedro is, you, like, it, it's instantly like, oh yeah, half past four, preparate. Like, you, you know what I mean? I know that's not going to mean much to, uh, <laughs> Preparate means a lot to me because I did it means a about lot to three you. <laughs> three minutes on it. Yeah, exactly. So you know, you know, there is that like that shared experience that just yeah. brings together who've never met. So do you remember the first time you saw it? Yes, I do. So I was at I was at uni in Sussex. I went down the corner shop. I went to a promoter that I knew offhand, and he was telling me about this room with this this, this film with this weird vampiric Belgian guy. Um I mean he's not Belgian but that's what he said at the time and I was like and it's just terrible and it's just people walking in and out of rooms saying stuff really badly. And you know, I'm I am i am a stickler for shit stuff anyway. You know, it's it's just I, I back back then I, I was looking for this ironic appeal and obviously I found it in spades with this movie. Yeah. Um, and I've I sat down with three or four friends from uni and um, just got drunk and we watched this movie and we were just howling all the way through to, from the first night, from the moment Tommy was all opened his mouth, we just, we we were just, and I think we watched it again the next day and then, you know, it, it, it really was, it's just this, this journey through like, this film can't get any worse and then it falls yeah. away. And then it finds a way, and <laughs> by the end you just you feel kind of like sad when it's over. Yeah, <laughs> and for you, you didn't it's very sad. sad. It's over, but like that journey when you go through with like four or five people that are close to you is is yeah you can't really repeat that. No, definitely. Now, normally I, I sort of do these episodes as a sort of recap, and we go through things and analyze them. But you've seen it. <sighs> a lot more than I have. I've probably watched it about three times in total. So I kind of want to treat this episode as like a quiz instead of just bashing the movie non-stop. So I'll be throwing questions your way on things I didn't understand. Um, many right. fans of my YouTube know I like to do end and explained videos. So I'll be probably stealing all of your words and doing one on this. But let's start off. What the hell is the movie about, Adam? Right. So, I picked up some plot points, but then some of them that they, they just seem to go <laughs> no. Like there's a gun subplot, um, and some of them just there's like a bit where they talk about some guy pissing his pants or something, um, <laughs> and it, I just kind of got lost a bit. There's a there's a breast cancer subplot, and um, that Claudette, the mother, has breast cancer, but she never never really ha nothing happens with it. What is the movie about? <laughs> um, what isn't the movie about? I think is the, um, is the answer. So there's two answers to this. Well, there are actually a few answers to this, right? Because it's not a deep and meaningful movie in of itself. He didn't know what the hell he was doing. Um, so, but the, I mean, the general thread, it, like the story, is actually pretty basic. The story at face level is just guy's best friend cheats on his or no, his, his, his bird cheats on his best friend him with his best friend and then he gets sad and kills himself um it, that like that's that in terms of the story that's it in, in terms of the themes he's exploring i think what he was you've got to kind of picture any kind of meaning like imagining the guy that you're looking at with the straggly hair and the weird droopy face you've got to imagine him slumped over a typewriter and think like He's literally thought, I'm going to make a film to try and validate myself because no one, no one wants anything to do with me creatively. So I'm going to do this for myself and I'm going to cram in every single issue I think is important. So, you know, he, he's sitting there and thinks, oh, that's a powerful thing. I'll pop that in there. Um, obviously, it goes nowhere because there was just... He, he just wasn't planning, ever planning to take those things anyway. He he just wanted to give them a shout out. The problem is, yeah. he gave them a shout out in terms of like things happening to main characters. Um, and you yeah. see, in the disaster artist, and it's recounted in the book as well. Uh, the actress that plays Cordette kind of questions it, like, like, 
it, what, my character has breast cancer. Like, I don't. Is this ever mentioned again? Does this come back? Like, and he's like, no, it's a twist. Yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah. It's like, there's quite a lot of those moments in in the film, and um, one of the biggest questions for me was, what does the title mean? The room. What does it actually mean? Like, how? Oh, no, how no, do no. Yeah, because I, fa- I found an answer from Tommy Wiseau, but I don't know if it's actually... This was reported as something he'd said. It was, because many things can happen in a room, some bad, some good. But I don't feel like that's... Someone's made that up, I think, but I don't know. So I've got no idea oh, at this point. Like him. That sounds like Okay. Him. Some things can happen in rooms, some good... Some there, uh, like you, if you can't imagine him saying, like there was no nothing too weird or stupid for him to say. Yeah. So, what do you That's think what? of Tommy Wiseau as a person? I mean, I, I don't know him as a person. Why? I, I, I don't. At the end of the day, I've I've seen his other stuff as well. I've seen The Neighbours. Yeah. Uh, which is a sitcom that he made after the room, after he'd been told by by everyone they found him funny. Um. It is I did, like I've seen the room thirty seven times. Right. Uh, I sat through three quarters of one half hour episode of The Neighbours and I couldn't finish it. Yeah, I heard that they tried to like kind of recapture it, but it was him intentionally trying to be funny, so it it's sort hard. of lost its appeal and it was quite cringy. Yeah, and it was really racist and really sexist as well, and I do get the feeling that, like, you you, uh, you know, you hear and read a lot, and it's in the disaster writers sort of alluded to as well. But he was kind of horrible to Lisa on set, like, yeah, he's like humiliated her for a body and stuff. Like, I don't actually think he's a good person. Like, the room is the the room being one of one of my favourite movies. It is not me saying that Tommy Wiseau is someone that I respect as an artist because everyone approached the room in the beginning through laughing at it. Yeah. Uh, and I think there is a lot about the actual s- story of the, the film specifically. Like, the film has a personality of its own at this point. Yeah. Uh, and I feel like Tommy Wiseau has kind of been given life by that and he's feeding off it. But it's it's a separate entity to him at this point. And I think the way that that came to be was quite admirable. Like, the sheer just the sheer knuckle-headed determination and self-belief, belief, despite not having a fucking clue what you're doing, is, like, that's, that's like, an impressive level of delusion, and that is, yeah. like, creates, and you create as well, like, that level of dedication and not dropping it to one side and losing heart is, like, I actually, I, I respect that part of how it came to be. Yeah, he's sort of completely, like, not self-aware, um, and it's sort of baffling how he just doesn't get how bad it is. Like, the disaster artist goes into it quite a bit, but I think the enigma that surrounds him sort of added a lot of the mystique to this. Um, apparently, he made his fortune selling coats, and in the disaster artist book, he's described as having a bottomless bank account. So... It, it's kind of strange that he had all these resources behind him, but we've never had like a clear answer. Like, no one really knows his age, where he's from. He, he, in this like movie, you could say he's thirty, or you could say he's fifty. You know, you just can't tell. Mm. Um, and Tommy, from my research, he wanted to make like an Oscar movie, and it kind of makes you think when you're watching it is there a checklist to making Oscar films that Tommy tried to exploit um, and in doing yeah and he sort of parodies parodies them a bit like we have suicide um, emotional performances sex scenes betrayal it's all very dramatic on the page but I think the acting is so bad that it becomes laughable Um, and even in making the movie he made some really weird choices like he bought two types of camera and shot on digital and film which is really weird Um, he also paid for the cameras instead of just renting them and the the stuff you read about him he's sort of like an idiot but I don't know if he's an idiot or if he's a genius because he's made so much money off this like 
and he he's obviously good with money because he he owns a lot of real estate um he was quite wealthy before making the room and it is kind of this how, how does this guy get by like mystery that surrounds him um because you can't imagine anyone hiring him to do a normal job so he was destined to sort of be in the room um but i've asked what the what the movie's about I've got the plot of the movie, um, so I'll read that out for the listeners who might not have watched The Room. So Johnny's a successful banker who lives in San Francisco with his fiancée, uh, Lisa, is it? Yeah. He showers her with dollars, with gifts and sex in the belly button, but she's still not satisfied. <laughs> um, she seduces his best friend, Mark, and the two begin a secret affair. Meanwhile, Johnny, having overheard Lisa confess her infidelity to her mother, Claudette, attaches a tape recorder to their phone in an attempt to <laughs> identify her lover. Uh, Denny, a neighbouring college student that Johnny financially and emotionally supports, has a run-in with an armed drug dealer called Chris R. Uh, I'm just going to skip that plot point because it doesn't really go anywhere. Denny also lusts after Lisa and confesses this to Johnny, who understands and encourages him to instead pursue one of his classmates from school. Um, Johnny spirals into a mental haze and calls upon Peter, his and Mark's friend, and a psychologist for help. Basically, they just have an affair. There's a surprise birthday party. Um, One of his friends catches Lisa kissing Mark while the other guests are outside and confronts them about the affair. Johnny announces that Lisa, he and Lisa are expecting a child. Now, this was a really weird thing I got caught up on. <laughs> yeah. Um, because I'm sure he mentions that they've been expecting it for 18 months or something. Um, but, yeah, that, that's not how <laughs> pregnancy works. Not really. Um, it's, just, it's one of the, it's this scene that you sort of, I mean, if it wasn't clear throughout the whole, whole movie, just how detached from human conversation he is yeah uh, there's like you, you can sort of tell that this oh sorry well the plot finishes basically Johnny finds out and kills himself but back to that point you were saying there's lots of strange and weird idioms that he comes out with and other characters do that make you realise that the script doesn't sound like it was written by someone who English was their first language like Two's great, but three's a crowd instead of two's company. Three's a crowd. Um, chocolate is the symbol of love. <laughs> not even that's not even close to any saying. That I've yeah, ever like leave your stupid comments in your pocket. Um, I say that all the time. Do you? <laughs> okay, maybe it is a saying then. Uh, but it's just weird, and even like they loop over each other's lines, um, and the dubbing's so off. It's just crazy that. Like Tommy thought this was good. I just, I just don't get it, Adam. In the, um, I've got the original script before editing. Okay. Uh, and this is before logic was applied. So the, the film that you're seeing is after a script supervisor right. has been through it. This script is just a collection of sentences. Um, basically, <laughs> one of them is, uh, Lisa brings breakfast down to Mark and says, here's your coffee and English muffin and burn your mouth. Nice. Um, yeah, and it's just like, the thing is, he was so, he just wanted to make a movie. Like, yeah. He, be, he, he had no, you know, training he didn't know what he was doing. He literally only made a movie because he wanted to be in a movie because no one else would put him in a movie because he was terrible. Um, so, as part of that, as part like he he had no. It's almost like he improvised the whole script. Like he just sat there and he typed, and it was like yeah. everything that he was thinking at the time just went in. So it's almost like this weird stream of consciousness thing and not in like a David Lynch way where it's artful weird but it's like you can sort of see the stream of thoughts that's going on behind it and then yeah. it'll just come out in these really garbled ways because he's just he's not only you know 
getting by in a language that clearly isn't his own, which he, he always tells people he's from New Orleans. He doesn't hear his accent. Like, he doesn't, he, I, like, I genuinely think he has had some kind of head injury. And yeah. I'm not, like, pathologize his, his weirdness, because, like, I know plenty of weird people. I know plenty of people that, you know, communicate weirdly with the outside world. There's nothing wrong with them. They're just weird. Um, there is, there is something, like, Deluge, dangerously delusional about him, and I think the weird garbled sort of idiom speak. Yeah, it's a symptom of a second language, but also he doesn't know it's a second language, so he genuinely just hears this stuff and thinks it's what people say. Yeah, and I don't know. I just I, I love the turns of phrase. Like I love things that are slightly wrong. Um, you know, that's why I read your your Twitter a lot because you do a lot of like. Dirk speak and whatever. I love all that. So like when when this is coming up, it's almost like if a comedian had written that on purpose for like a Borat like character, it would be hilarious. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, I can totally see the appeal in that. And you are like, it is very clear that there is one vision behind this. Like he's doing the script, the directing, the editing, and what happens is. Like this is an example of when full creative control is given to someone who doesn't really know what they're doing. Like yeah. there's people like Stanley Kubrick who could easily write the script, direct it, edit it, but Tommy was always just not accepting that. Like apparently he fired the whole crew originally. He fired quite a lot. like I, I read somewhere that the guy who plays Mark, um, Greg, he wasn't the original actor. Um, and he nope. got fired and there was reports that actors even try to reword lines so they made sense but Tommy would catch them and, and tell them to do what he'd written and it's sort of a very domineering view of the project to its detriment but in a way it makes it better because if this was just a mediocre movie it wouldn't have the reputation that it does not at all and I think when you say uh, actually with the Mark thing as well he didn't just have like replaced the original Mark. He was filming Greg Sestero scenes in secret. So he was he was filming okay. scenes with the old Mark, and then he he was basically editing a secret movie with Greg Sestero in. Yeah, like the guy that his, with, the, with the domineering set stuff, and like you know, you you see the disaster artist, and you read about it as well. Like it's it created a horrible atmosphere on set. It was unsafe you know, ridiculously hot with no water. He was kind of an asshole director, uh, I think a complete asshole director at points. And, yeah. and, you know, he really didn't know what he was doing. But it's almost like, like the people now must be getting mad royalties from the room anyway, so they been, they now won't regret their experience in it fully. Yeah. Um, the, the actual... It's one of those experiments that would have had to happen, like, by some person with too much money and too much time on their hands and a warped sense of humour, like, giving money to someone they knew could have made a movie and asking them to make a movie. Like, that, it's the kind of thing that would have had to be an active choice somewhere down the line, but because it's happened just organically, because it's just some guy who had loads of money and decided to do it himself uh, it's yeah. like an experiment that, that set itself up and no one needed to actually kind of yeah. engineer that situation, I mean it didn't have to happen obviously but I'm talking about someone so inept having all of that power uh, it doesn't that so would so rarely happen by the means that it did for the room yeah, there's, there's sort of like a really weird surreal element to it as well that to me is one of the other reasons that it's so popular. Like, I, I noticed today, like, when he's on... And this is the first time I've ever noticed it, but it's it's once you see it, it's completely obvious. Like, when he walks out and he does it, oh, hi, Mark, the, the shed bit that he walks out of, it, it's literally on the edge of the roof. So there's no way that you could go up the stairs in there like th that room couldn't have a staircase in it and it feels very sort of 
there's lots of overly manufactured sections like the green screen backgrounds where they've clearly spent a lot of time um, some of the sets themselves but there's no sort of thought process to it um, like they don't use makeup on the, on the sets which like if you, if people don't know like skin tones just don't look good on film um, you have to use makeup a lot of the time and there's sort of an attention to detail that's really missing from it um, and it makes the movie itself sort of have this weird atmosphere to it almost um, there's sort of something above it like when we were doing the um, Shining for early, earlier in this podcast you sort, sort of notice with that film that things just don't seem right and out there's a, like a slight out of place thing about them like a lot of the rooms in The Shining if you were to draw a map of the hotel from above the rooms couldn't exist because they sort of overlap each other and go around corners and there's a lot of that in this movie and it sort of makes I don't know the, the like have you seen Hereditary? I haven't seen oh, Hereditary right, okay, so have... Hereditary is like a horror movie where there's sort of like a sort of overtone of things going wrong um, mm-hmm. and I sort of feel that in this movie as well when I'm watching it there's sort of a sense over the top of it that there's something hidden, hidden in the subtext that makes it really unnerving like Denny the, the relationship that he has with Johnny it, it's really weird and strange and sort of and there's other things like time wise it all seems kind of off there's one day in the film where about 70 different things happen in the one day and none of those things could happen in that time scale but they just keep happening and happening and happening in the scene on top of scene and I don't, it's just really weird watching it like you, you do get this feeling like yeah there's something this is like hell they just don't realise they're in hell it's just a never-ending day of nightmares. Yeah, I mean, they, uh, when we saw Rick Sestero in his talk, he said one of the best theories he's heard is that Denny is actually a cat. Right, okay. If, and, like, obviously I've rewatched it since, and, like, it yeah. figures. It, like, it holds it actually, up. <laughs> it, Jay, if you, if you just forget he's talking and watch it, what he's actually doing, the way he's sitting, we're, like, jumping on the bed with them and shit, like, he yeah, be, he convincingly could be just Tommy Wiseau's interpretation of a fucking cat. Like, um, yeah, it's it's got this really surreal edge where I think if someone like David Lynch or Charlie Kaufman made this movie on purpose, frame for frame, exactly the same performances, script, everything the same, but yeah, Charlie Kaufman's name on it instead of Tommy Wiseau's, it would be called a work of surreal subversive genius and people would be trying to read into it the only difference is that these decisions weren't deliberate so it's a complete clusterfuck um but there there's so there is so much that's wrong with the root with with every fro- like the the those pictures of spoons yeah and, uh you can almost like he thought that there's a lot of like, oh, the audience won't know that. Like, w- when you're reading the disaster, right? It's like, oh, the audience aren't going to notice that. Like, they're stupid. So it's basically like him telling the audience they're stupid and sort of like showing up, not obviously not consciously, but in doing that, in making a film where he has literally, as the, direct, the sole creator of the film, thought, people are so stupid that I don't like, I can just have pictures of spoons in the background. Yeah. Uh, um, and the, everyone in the movie is so stupid, and he's pretty stupid, and it's just this, like, massive expose of just, like, compounding idiocy that is just, because of the way it's rooted in real life, it just makes the story that much more stupid, and, like, it's kind of like the audience are laughing at themselves as well. It's like, you, you, you use the word uneasy, and I think that's actually really appropriate because it is, yeah. it is like weird friction with like we're laughing at this guy but we're having a good time but like what's what like it, it, it's all of that friction at once and like you say uneasy and I think that is absolutely the right approach because I think storytelling should be uneasy and often it's quite you know very structured like leading you through this emotion and that emotion and this is how I'm making you feel uneasy and cranking up the tension and whatever but because 
it, because of the way the story behind the room, and because it's essentially all of these different types of idiocy sort of rubbing up against each other and creating a really unique kind of tension that you just, I don't think you get from any other film on purpose or by accident. Yeah. Um, and that tension, it doesn't drive the story because the story is pointless, but it's part of driving that friction and that tension where you've got like, Tommy was oh didn't mean to make this movie, but I'm having such a good time, but I'm laughing at him, but he's terrible. But yeah, like, so you've got all of these different like intentions for again, and it, and it's like that friction has created a very different way to any other movie I've seen. Definitely, um, and the weird thing about it is there's quite a lot of sex scenes in it, and these off when you watch like your top ten weirdest things about the room, these don't really get put in there. But there's so many early on, and it's kind of creepy. Like Lisa seduces Mark at some point, and the music's really weird, and it's just—I don't know—it's sort of like a nightmare. Like even the couple who want to have sex in their apartment, um, it just seems like sex is put in there for the sake of it. Like you could pass it off as a softcore por- porno at points, like the whole belly button thing, famously, where Johnny's sort of humping her belly button. It's just really weird. I think. So this sort of goes back to imagining him hunched over a typewriter. I think he like bought like three books on how to make a film, like I don't know, how to write a story, how to direct a film and how to sell a film. I feel like he got those three guidebooks and sat down and thought, How do I get these as bluntly as possible into this movie without making it seem stupid? Obviously he didn't know that what he was making was stupid. But the the sex scenes almost feel like he he read a thing that said, you know, I need the sex to sell this movie. Um, here you go, five minutes of it within the first seven. Yeah. There you go. So so it it's part of that. I mean, it's, it's terrible, and the fact that he had to use one of the scenes twice as well. Yeah. Um, <laughs> it, it's like this. That's that to me is one of the meta moments sort of thing the meta things about the movie where it's like you're not watching the movie you're watching a guy go that is editing just go how do i make it look like she didn't want to have sex with me again yeah um just the the the, the like the the lonely aspect of of just just this strange little man thinking this up and it's i know it's like the the obvious sad downside of that is that the actress uh juliet daniel just had a horrible time on set yeah, um, you know it was it was really bad. And that's part of of what I'm really uncomfortable with about Tommy Wiseau is his his attitude to women and um, also the complete lack of anyone that isn't white in the movie. Um, it like there's weird elements to his personality that I'm just I wouldn't hang around with someone like him if um, you know and the sex scenes are part of that. Um, but I also think they feed this kind of weird narrative behind the movie without even really having this say anything. Like you didn't you didn't need to read anything about the disaster writers to know exactly why those scenes were so awkward. Yeah, it sort of reminds me a bit of Bioshock a bit. Like this world is sort of Tommy's like utopia but it's just so, so weird. Like, even when he walks into the flower shop and the owner's like, oh, I didn't recognise you. Like, this guy looks like Michael... <laughs> he looks like Michael Jackson crossed with Slender Man, and there's no way on earth <laughs> that you wouldn't see him a mile off. Um, but it's like, hi, doggy, you're my favourite customer. It's it just so really weird. It's like everyone, tr- like, on drugs, like what the perfect world in Tommy Wiseau's eyes would be like. Um, and it's, yeah, it's just really... Women are really portrayed badly in this. Like, there's no uh, redeeming... There's like, Claudette, who's the manipulative mother to Lisa, she, she's really weird. She wants Lisa to marry Johnny, but uh, she's just a piece of shit, really. Um, and yeah. she, she makes, like, these grand statements... Um, but they're all sort of very shallow, like the breast cancer thing. She just sort of, like, the way she delivers the, oh, I've got breast cancer. She doesn't even seem like she's that bothered that she has breast cancer. She just kind of drops it in, like, oh, I had a quiche for lunch. 
it's it's really weird. Um, and Lisa wants to have an affair one second, but then she loves Johnny the next. Um, and I just I just don't get it. I don't I don't know what's Absolutely. happening. At screenings, when when Lisa said anything like "women change their mind all the time," uh, the whole audience shouts out, "It's because you're a woman!" Yeah. Like e- everyone is aware of, of the treatment of women in this movie, but it's almost like a kind of narrow-minded idiot. Yeah. So Lisa's this, like, sorry, sorry. No, no, you go like, on determination and like because of the lack of talent it's like this like you say he's built this utopia for himself and it's like a view inside the head of someone where all that matters is himself it's like the Malkovich Malkovich world and being John Malkovich yeah. like you know he's got this perfect world where everyone loves him and you know women don't really matter and everyone's white and it's like that's why it's uncomfortable to be there but it's just that unfiltered view inside this, like, kind of bigoted guy's head. And it's, like, that's why it's uncomfortable. And, like, I, I you know, and I, I even feel uncomfortable saying I'm as fond of the movie as I am. But yeah. <laughs> I think every, everyone, this, like, because of that ironic distance that you have from it from the beginning, it feels safe to enjoy watching it. Like, if you were really invested in the story... You'd be like, hang on a second, am I actually a massive woman hating racist? Yeah. But just laughing at how bad it is, the misogyny and, and kind of lack of diversity sort of fall into that, laughing at it. But it's when you actually you start to look at the human parts of him, like the determination and, and the actual, you know, the, the the fact that he's lonely. Well, I'm not surprised that he's lonely, really. Yeah. And it doesn't, it doesn't. But like, I just love that we're getting unfiltered view like not tampered for studio not tampered with anyone that would make it make any sense into just the head of someone that we never want to meet yeah definitely and lisa sort of is the villain of the piece really like she gets drunk um no she gets johnny drunk sorry on what does he drink it's like some weird is it a hot chocolate whiskey yeah, it's just really, really weird, like something you would never drink. But anyway, um, so she gets him drunk and then frames him for hitting her. But why did she need to get him drunk just to say that he hit her? Like, anyway. Would well, know he didn't hit her anyway because he, he did not. He did so, not. Sorry, that's my Tommy was our impression for the pod podcast everyone's got one but anyway mark tells he goes up to the roof and mark tells him this story about this girl that got beat up and he just laughs about it and goes wow what a story and then he goes i'm so i'm so lucky to have you as my best friend and i love lisa so much and it's this constant jumping back and forth between character emotions that i think just it's so jarring and it's it is crazy that no one stepped in and just said look stop this shit it's weird and then to make it even weirder Denny comes up and he just wants to play football 24-7 oh yeah uh, football crazy yeah and he, he talks about loving Lisa and Johnny's explaining how she loves him back but it's like if he was suspecting his future wife as he calls her of cheating on someone cheating with someone why isn't Denny like the first in the firing line when he's coming up and admitting that he loves her and you you would think that that's like uh, you think they would all come to a head and that would be like a, a plot point where Johnny starts to suspect Denny and they, they lose their friendship because of it and then he finds out it's Mark but it just doesn't really go anywhere um, I mean I think Denny is the weirdest character in it by yeah. a long way. He's, he feels like he's in a different... He feels like he's in a, a different movie completely to everyone else. He's sort of got this whole... Um, he's in love with Johnny and in love with Lisa. He's like the third person in their relationship. And, yeah, I just I just don't get it, Adam. Basically, with, with Denny, there is... He's almost there because... There is no one else in the movie that Johnny could realistically 
show that he's actually a nice person. Like you can show that you're a, a someone's a good partner in a movie or romantic or whatever. Um, but you know, they, they it's trying to show that like in this weird little Tommy Wiseau utopia, not only does everyone love him, he actually deserves it as well. Okay. Because Denny is like because he's funding Denny's way through college and doing. They make so many points of like. Uh, you know, oh, he's paying him through college. Oh, he's like his dad. Oh, he's, you know, they like pile on more and more. And it's like Denny is this little totem to Johnny and therefore Tommy with those overriding goodness, um, which is why he doesn't make much sense as a character because he was never thought of as a character. The drugs thing makes absolutely no sense. Yeah. Um, you know, there's very, there's very little of that actually happens to or as a result of Denny that will have any impact on the movie. Um, the, own, the only bit he's in that really matters is when he's upset because Johnny's dead. But again, he's quite, I feel like he's just there to show that people would be upset if Johnny slash Tommy was, were dead. Like this whole movie just feels like a cry for help. Yeah. Do, right, here's a theory for you. Does Mark have superpowers? Because... Uh, I mean, he's very busy. Yeah, and there's that guy who they're chucking the football about and Mark barely touches him when he's talking about underwear and he goes flying in the bins like he goes flying across the room. It's like wire work and we'll learn that he's got one hell of a temper because he nearly throws that guy off the building when he's accused of having an affair with Lisa. What do you think of Mark in the story? Because I know everyone tends to talk about Johnny and Tommy but what about Mark? What are his dreams? Does, does Mark have dreams? I don't even know what his job is. Yeah. Uh, I've seen it 38 times. I couldn't tell you what Mark's about, apart from looking hunky and dating women who then get beat up and put in a hospital on Guerrero Street. Yeah. Um, I, again, like, I don't really know what any character in this movie wants, because I don't think Tommy Wiseau knows what people want and I think he's like he comes you know he's very paranoid and you, you read a lot and you see it in interviews as well he doesn't like being asked about himself he doesn't he doesn't know what people want so none of these characters want anything they're just yeah. they're just there sort of milling around Mark Mark still is that it's like I don't know he's not got superpowers um, <laughs> he's just like they they were Tommy Wiseau was talking about having vampires in the movie at one point as okay. well. Okay, that would have been um, good. I don't know if that's like a little aftershock of that where they took it out of the script, but I honestly think that Tommy was like, right, we have to have an amusing scene now because they're talking about underwear, underwear, right, which is intrinsically funny uh, as we all know. Um, so they're like, you know, this conversation gets out of hand. He's got to tell this embarrassing story to more people. Uh, and Tommy was like, didn't really know how to escalate that scene into a punchline. So then you, you had to have someone falling over. But there wasn't really a reason to have someone fall over. He just kind of needed the scene to end. Yeah. Um, so he just like, barely touches him and then he goes flying and then he picks yeah. him up and they leave. No, yeah. there's, no, there's, there's no discernible reason why that happens to someone else. Yeah. <laughs> And then they get the tuxedos, the lovely tuxedo scene. Oh, yeah. And they decide to go and play football in them for some reason. I don't, I, I don't know what, what's, what the hell's going on. And one of the, so the accountant, oh, is it the psychiatrist or someone? He's got glasses, so he's he's got a good job anyway. Uh, he falls over. <laughs> they all kind of pile on him um, in a, a quite a homoerotic way. Um, and then they have this gathering to announce the big, the big baby. Um, and another thing, like Tommy's with Johnny, the, Tommy and Johnny are the same person anyway. But he's had this tape of Lisa cheating for a while, but he hasn't listened to it for confirmation till now. Um, yeah. So anyway, he finds out and he kills himself. At the end, um, like, I think by, like, the 20th viewing or something, you sort of learn to s step back and look at it as just a guy, like, 
imagine writing a battle, right? And you're trying to do like 50 different angles or whatever. And you're like trying to say everything. But like when you're in an experienced battle, you don't really know how to edit it down to. I mean, you did, but you were, you were actually good. Um, when like, and it's like that, it's like these loose ends that kind of aren't fulfilled. And it's just, it, you, I don't know. It's just, it's just an experience. It's part of one of the maddening parts of the movie. And I think if there were like 30% of them, it would just mean the movie wasn't enjoyable. Because yeah. it's just like a labyrinth of lost ends. It's like, it, it's just each one, it, each one becomes a better joke as it goes along. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah, I get what you mean. Um, yeah, it, it, it is so. It is quite. I know we kind of have went off a bit and got quite dark on it, but it is quite a fun film to watch. Um, I can imagine with people. I, I I didn't watch it with anyone, but I just sort of every couple of minutes was like, <laughs> and just sort of um, shaking my head a bit with a smile on my face. Um, but this ending, it it's very dark. Um, it reminds me of what we used to do for a school play when we used to do our final project in drama at school <laughs> yeah. where everyone's project was about someone cheating and then someone committing suicide it, it le- so he puts the gun in his mouth bang he falls back Lisa runs up and asks if he's dead um, which is like yeah he's just shot himself in the head she then <sighs> I don't really get this dynamic like she wants to she sort of says to Mark he's dead when we can be together but she's also devastated that he's dead and then Mark does the famous get out of my life you bitch Uh, Denny runs in they go he's in a better place (laughs) which he's not really yeah I killed me Um, and Denny's just so sad and then the police sirens go off and it's the end yeah. So, <laughs> I mean, there's not really much to read into that. <laughs> yeah. So, what what are your final thoughts on the film? Well, it like I am literally about to sit down with one of my colleagues from work and introduce them to the room. Yeah. Uh, first time, like it is something. It will always be for me a way of like gauging someone's sense of humour and like yeah, I like as you say, we got pretty dark on it and like Yeah, I kinda wish we'd went more fun with it to be honest, but it's just yeah. one of those things. I know, I mean like I love it, but I'd like again it's the thirty thirty eighth time tonight, like I'm kind of past the point of, of seeing it as this like ha ha, this guy made a shit thing. There's so much shit stuff up out there, right? Any, any film could any, at any time replace that as the worst movie of all time if it wanted to um, but it's like you sort of have to step back and, and like appreciate like this happen because they're so rare that like so many strangers pull together over something that's so relentlessly relentlessly fucking stupid and misguided yeah. Uh, but yeah and it, it's I tell you what watching the disaster artist kind of it's therapeutic almost to me because I've always been like I've always made shit stuff. Like I'm not, I've, I'm, I'm better now, but like I've always like made stuff that's been deliberately shit because I found it funny. Yeah, and like it, it actually made me like think twice about what it is to make something good or bad. Like what's behind it? Like it, and I think if you make something with sincerity, that's just that's all that can be asked. And this film was made with like. 400% sincerity. He wanted this film to exist so bad. Um, it just feels wrong to begrudge him it, you know? Yeah. Um, it's, it will, it will always be like something I, I laugh through with friends, but yeah, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. It wasn't as whimsical as you expected. Um, it's okay. I appreciate it. Uh, the disaster artist made me all, all reflective on it though. Like it I genuinely get feels at the end of that movie. Yeah. I think it works great as a piece of what not to do. Like, literally everything in it you could take to a film student and be like, right, don't do this, don't do this. And it's going to massively influence their decisions in the future. Obviously, it's got a huge following and it is entertaining. It's just sort of baffling how it got made. It's a, It really is like a once-in-a-blue-moon film that just had so many 
bad things come together to make it this masterpiece. And the world is probably a better place for it. It is. It really is. I I think I wouldn't know approximately 80% of my friends' group if it weren't for the room. Like, honestly, from the last 10 years, yeah. anyone that I've been close to has either had to watch the room at some point or had already seen it. Like, it is just that movie, but... That's why, I mean, that's why it still does midnight screenings. Like, there is no independent, truly independent film that has made as much back off of its investment. Like, yeah. if you're looking at it in terms of pure financial success, like, it's got to be, like, you've got to look at that as one of the best successes of all time as well. Even though it wasn't by traditional means or because it, it did it on merit, it's still... Yeah. I've kind of got to hat to that. I respect that a lot. So, it's... I'm just looking now to see how much the room's gross in total. There's lots of different reports. They don't. Um, they, 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 the, the final figures, they still don't know. Yeah. They s- roughly said anywhere between $7 million and $30 million, which is good. So it's it's definitely made Tommy, who financed it all, more of a, a multi-millionaire than he already was. So, you know, it just goes to show sometimes when you go after your dreams, if you're persistent and you put your heart into it, they can come true. That is literally it. Like, that, that I know that's a really, like, cheesy thing to say, but that is literally what happened. And, like, he doesn't... He's not, like, some super gifted kid or, you know... He, he is literally an idiot. <laughs> yeah. An idiot with money... Or, like, the other moral of the story is be an idiot with money and then you can do pretty much whatever you want. Yeah. Which is always a nice thing to to, to end on. It's a message of, of hope for everyone. Take so, that home, viewers. Rub that in, in your cockles and warm them. Exactly. So before we say goodbye, do you have anything you want to promote and get people to check out? Uh, yes, please. Um... You guys can go to thelman.bandcamp.com. Uh, that's where all my music lives. I've got a new album drop in um, on the 29th of November. Um, it's got people like Professor Elemental on it and Adam the Rapper. Um, they're, they're good at rapping. Um, and I've got a battle with O'Shea dropping very soon as well, so watch out for that. And, uh, yeah, go and watch The Room with some friends, preferably drunk. Um, yeah. And um, that's yeah. I don't have any friends, so I can't I can't do that. But thanks for stopping by, and make sure you subscribe, listeners. Uh, our next yeah, episode, subscribe. we're going to be covering the thing with Theo Kane from Slimehouse TV. Um, it's one of my favourite movies, so definitely keep an eye out for it. And thanks again, Adam. It's been lovely Thank speaking you, to you, and I've grown a new appreciation. Internet. Yeah, I've grown a new appreciation for this film, and I hope the listeners have too. Um, So I'll see you around. Take care. Much love. Goodbye. Goodbye.